four by four out there there is some mesquite uh, some of it has punky middles but he said it is up for grabs for whoever gets it first and so if you would like some of that just go ahead and take it and uh, whatever he doesn't get rid of we'll go back to Knox City so he'd get a lot better gas mileage if it was all gone David down below where you come in there's some three ring binders that my neighbor gave me last night if you want them to pick them up they're there when I leave they're going to the dumpster okay not going back to my house <laughs> all right I want, I want to talk about our classes and the skills we try to teach in our classes. <clears throat> we, we are going to be utilizing the, the Thompson tool because it comes with uh, the, the three different gouges and it, it comes with another piece that's just going to be uh, ground to the shape. It, it has no grind on it. And you can grind it to whatever shape you want. Uh, I did a, a three-point tool with mine. Uh, the three gouges, there is a V-shaped bow gouge. There is a spindle gouge, and there is a detail gouge. The, the difference in those is the, you know, I think the detail gouge has a little narrower flute. Uh, it's, it's something that you can sharpen to a longer fingernail grind and uh, the spindle gouge is you know is the shallower <coughs> well I, I would say it's probably the middle depth flute the bowl gouge deepest <laughs> spindle gouge is the medium and the uh, no that was spindle this this one would be detailed okay I'm, I'm gonna start out today using the uh, the regular spindle couch okay in our classes we assume that everyone knows nothing even if they know and have been turning before we take nothing for granted so we're going to teach some sharpening because sharpening is something that makes turning a whole lot easier. Okay, so the first thing we will do when we get to wood is we will have folks locate center and this is something that I picked up from Ron Barnett in one of his demonstrations. When you're using a center finder like this, mark it from all four corners because of the width of whatever you're using you know it's it's going to create a square or a rectangle in the middle then we want to put a center indentation in it and you know after the first meeting everybody is real comfortable with this and uh, you know we can get it done fairly quickly. <laughs> so, there is both ends. So, we 
momentarily will demonstrate how to do this. And then we will have them mount their wood in between the centers. And we usually use the safety drives. We've got three or four of those. And some just use the spur drives. So we're bringing it up. Now, another thing that we do is we stress the safety rules and safety every time. We look for little things like does the lathe fit the turner? You know, down, in, down at the Garden and Art Center, you know, I was a teacher for years and years. Well, you know, they got those paper choppers with the big long arms. You know, I've always called that a guillotine because I've known more than one teacher that has nipped off part of a finger <laughs> with one of those. But uh, they've got one of those down there. There have been instances in class where we've gotten that guillotine down off the cabinet put it in front of the table and had the turner stand on it to elevate them to get them to where they are the right height and how do you tell if you are the right height you stand with your arm in an L if your elbow matches the tool rest it is not too high or not too low you know, Willard and I, you know, a lathe that would fit Willard, I would have to get the guillotine out to stand on. And, uh, you know, if he was going to use a lathe that fit me, we'd have to cut off about a foot off of his legs. <laughs> okay, now, the next thing that we try to teach is how to get your tool rest at the correct height. Now we're generally going to start off with some sort of roughing gouge and, and uh, you know our club did, did spring for some tool sets but we didn't have enough money to get six roughing gouges so if you've signed up to help uh, and you've got a roughing gouge, you can bring it. But that's all you'll need to bring. Because our tool sets for the club, we've got the Thompson, we've got a, a parting tools, and we've got skews. And in the beginner classes, that's all we need. So, how do you determine where to set the tool rest? Well, one of the things that works pretty well is if we put the tool level on the tool rest, the bottom of the flute should be even with center point. Now, Right now, I am too low. Well, what is that going to affect? Would it cut? Probably. Would it cut best? No. So, if I bring it up to where it matches, and this is easiest to do before you put your wood on, but I forgot that a minute ago. I'm still a little bit low. So, I get this up. Boom, there it is. Now, I'm ready to put my wood back on.
Okay, one of the things I've noticed with when I was teaching and in classes, a lot of people worry, especially in roughing out, about the undulations in the wood. If we use our tool rest as a guide for how much of the tool is overhanging the tool rest, we stand a much better chance of keeping the material parallel or even if our tool rest is in line with the ways of the bed. So how do I do that? Well, first of all, we know we want around one-eighth of an inch clearance. So I, I, I've got my one-eighth clearance and, you know, if I've got my center marks perfectly, this gap is pretty close, but there is yet another thing we can do I can sight down and match the tool rest up with the corner of the way down here and assure that I'm I'm pretty close to parallel. I probably need to come out just to touch it. All right. Now, I've got my tool rest set. What do I need to do before I turn the lathe on? Ah, I spin it by hand. That is a must every time that we readjust the tool rest. Check and make sure that the wood clears. We want to check and Make sure all adjustments are secure. We want to check our speed uh, because, you know, we are primarily using mini and midi lays in the, uh, the turning class. Now, probably the biggest mistake I see beginners making as they are putting a death grip on this tool. Okay? They'll have white knuckles. When you're all tensed up, it's harder to manipulate the tool. Now, in our Eli Abacera class that we had up here a year ago. One of the things he recommended was change your grip. He said your, your grip hand point your finger. That does a couple of things. Number one, it makes it a little bit easier to manipulate the tool. Second thing it does is it keeps you from squeezing because you really don't have to have just a super tight grip on the tool. So we're going to teach roughing out. We try to teach anchor bevel cut, where you anchor the tool. The first thing to touch is the bevel, raise it until you get a cut, and then you can move right on down. Now, why I just doing this little nibble. Why don't I start going all the way down? 
because this is the technically correct way to do it. Now, once, once I get it to the point where, and I forgot my smock, I'm going to end up with sawdust in my underwear. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to do, no, I'm just going to button. And that one's done. Okay, but, huh? You can't talk about the same thing. Yeah, okay. Now, once we get a majority of the corners knocked off, we can speed up the length. So, I'm going to do that. And, here's the deal, folks. I am convinced. that we probably don't run roughing gouges high enough on the wood. I got one in my mouth then. Okay? Now, the beginners really like, oh, you know, that trick. So that's, you know, that's something to show them that, hey, you don't have to turn it off to see if it's round. So, you know, I am now doing something I don't normally do. I'm not even looking at the wood. I'm looking out there into audience land. Because that's how easy rocking out is. Once I get the right angle. Once I have everything set right. Because what we've got to get across in our teaching is turning is tactile. You know, when when you were coming this morning, show of hands, how many of you drove here this morning? Okay, when you came to a turn, did you think, oh, I've got to step on the brake. I've got to begin turning the wheel hand over hand or tractor style. And then, you know, as you get to the turn, oh, oh, I've got to start letting the wheel go back the other way so I can go straight. Did you think about those things? No. They have become automatic. Why have they become automatic? Practice. Practice. All right. Now, here is another thing that I like to show. Because, you know, um, this is almost clean all the way down. It's, it's all the way here and just a little bit down here. But, using the correct technique, anchor, bevel, cut, I can put the tool on there, start spinning the wood by hand, <laughs> I'm rubbing the bevel as I lift the back edge. Can you get that, Matt? Do you see? Do you see the cut that's happening there? Can you zoom in here? Thank you, Jim. I could do all my turning just like this. It would just take forever. <laughs> Everything right. Sharp tools, correct positioning, correct tool angle, Makes it easy. Okay, so I'm going to finish getting this all the way down. Now I'm going to look at it. And what we need to 
do is get to where we can feel the differences through the tool to our hands. Alright, so that's that. I intend to do something else with this later on, so I'm through with the I'm through with the uh, roughing gouge. Later on in the class, we're going to have to teach how to make a good tenon. Okay? And we're going to teach the parting tool. Now, because I have gotten in the habit of practicing the Eli technique, when I pick it up, it's just automatic now. So, probably the biggest mistake is people bring this in too level, too flat. You've got to present it the same angle that you do, or the same technique. Anchor, bevel, now you've got to cut. So that's where it's going to be cut off here in a minute. Okay, now I'm going to put a tenon on this end. I can use my skew to make it a dovetail. But, in making this two things are critical. This shoulder needs to be square. We don't need any buildup in the corner. We don't want to fill it in there. We want it to be a nice, crisp corner. Why? Because that is the main bearing surface of the chuck. So, Oh yeah, I'm a fit. I have yet to make me one of those fancy wooden blocks, you know, go, no, go. Uh, I just haven't done it. So, I'm going to end up cutting that off. Alright, so let's now get a different parting tool and go ahead and I'll, I'll end up cutting some more down, but a technique, especially when we are going deep with the parting tool, is we've got to create space. We've got to create clearance. Because even on a diamond shaped parting tool, you're going to get down so deep and then it's going to start binding. So, I don't have to create a lot of clearance. But I need to create some. Okay, now I'm going to switch to a diamond parting tool. Or a not a diamond, but a thin curve. Using the same technique. Now, because I didn't bring my little saw, I'm going to go ahead slow it all, uh, slow it way down. And 
Uh, it's close. Okay. Now. Why didn't you put a tenon on both ends? Why? Because this is going to be the only one I'm out in a chuck. Okay. This is will become practice. So, I've got it close enough that I can guess where the center is. So I'm going to bring this up. Now, we don't do this in class like this. I generally have all, or not generally, I have the wood, you know, size to fit so that you know the students don't have to do this part so I'm gonna put it back where it was and it's probably pretty close but to be on the safe side I'm gonna hit it again with the Spindle roughing gouge. Now I'm a little out, but it's close enough. Especially after I do this. Okay. The first exercise we will do with students is one that I, one of the things we can do since we bought shoes is we can teach V groups using the skew and so I think this is a, a really safe cut with the skew even for beginners and, and one of the things we need to do is, you know, say, hey, we can look at the back profile there to see our depth. And we'll make this one a little wider. Now, hey, we'll do this all the way across. I'm going to skip to the chase. Teeth with the party tool. Okay. That is enough. Now, we are ready. Alright, first thing we teach is a bead. So, using the correct grip, the way I do it, which may or may not be wrong, but I tend to believe my way is the right way. <laughs> I'm going to double check my depth, it looks good. I'm going to come up, start in the middle, anchor bevel, Get a cut, and then roll the wrist. Okay? Got half a bead. Coming back the other way, same thing. I'm just rolling the tool and lifting the back handle. Now, here is something that I think is important. I will demonstrate. We will turn the lathe off. And then I'll say, okay, here is what I want you to do with the lathe off. Get up here. Get the feel for what is going to be happening as you roll and raise 
the back of the handle. Now, a lot of times we talk about this as a clock with the flute being, when it's open, 12 o'clock. When it goes this way, it's at 3. When it goes this way, it's at 9. So, I'm starting at 12 in the center, getting the feel for rolling the tool to 3 o'clock. Oh, I almost cut it right there. I, I am cutting it right there. And ending up. Because the tool handle, in fact, must rise to keep your correct cutting angle all the way to the bottom. Same thing, going the other direction. Get the feel. Get the feel. Okay? Now, going to the left is more uncomfortable for me. Generally, the left side of my beads don't look this good. I got lucky. <laughs> okay, but a way to cheat. When, when I'm being a natural right-hander going to the left is if I adjust my grip start with my finger on the side of the tool oh I can go that way a lot easier okay so I would have the student practice you know, five or six times with the lid off both directions. And then I'd say, okay, how do you feel about that? Yeah, yeah, I think I got it. Okay. All right. Now, so, we practice. We practice. Oh, now that one looks goofy. So, can I fix Gooby? Yes. I need to move this block of wood. So that I can watch that back profile. That looks a little better. Yeah. Alright, now, we would continue on with this. Oh, bummer. Just make beads. Not that hard. Is it? Now, now, I want to say this. I know that Buddy from down south, Colorado City, Colorado City he attributes. <laughs> A lot of his tool men, or a lot of his tool skills to snowmen. Why? Because he, he, that's what he warms up on. He practices on snowmen. I, I attribute a lot of my tool skills to baby rattle. Because I've made, you know, probably 200 of them. And the more I practice, the better I become. When I first started doing the baby rattles, it took me about an hour on the lake. Now that time has shrunk down to about 25 minutes on the lake. Why? Repetition and getting the feel where this be can become automatic where I don't have to think about what to do so
Pick you a project for Pick a Pick a practice piece like this. You can do this out of firewood. It doesn't matter. Because the more you the more time you spend with your tools in your hand making things and that one looks good if you should. I have just discovered something. Why do these look a lot better than these? Because these were the ones I spent the time to make the V-groove with the parting tool. So guess what? From now on in class, when we are laying these out, let's use the skew. Because it's easier to get a better bead. Or at least I think so. It is for me, because we've always done it this way. This is the first time I've tried this, so, you know. Let's try it. And go that way. See, right there is where it, it bothers me. And see, that was going the uncomfortable way for me, and it's a whole lot better. Okay. All right. So, we keep doing this over and over until they are fairly comfortable with this project. Okay. Uh, Gordon, could you come up here and help me for a minute? As a mentor, what do I do? Okay, so uh, Gordon, what I want you to do is I want you to make a bead here and a bead here, and let's look at what I do. Okay? Yep. All right. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm watching this tool angle. Okay, you need to start raising about, raise, 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 excellent, excellent, good job, do another one, got to raise it, raise your turn, all the way to, hey, good, you got it all the way to 30, good, raise, 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 good, Good job, Gordon. That's all I do. <laughs> now, there what? Get back over here. Okay. Wait. Now, see, Gordon. Gordon has had some practice since the last time we did this together. His beads look a lot better. But to get the feel. For the tool roll, a lot of times, especially, okay, let's practice one. But no, we're not cutting it, we're just practicing. Oh, okay. Okay. Sometimes I will get up here as he's starting and I will twist the back of the tool handle to help him get the feel for that turn and the raise because it's all by feel. Did I do that with you when you first started? Yep. Yep. And, you know, throughout the class, as we're doing different projects, sometimes, well, I don't know about, well, most all the students, especially for, he kind of crept back into some bad habits. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I kind of have some hand gestures that I use. I think I used them on Jerry too. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What was it? You know, this. What does this mean? Keep that tool pointed up. It cuts so much better when you're getting that shear angle than when you're going in level. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, now. Practice this, practice this, practice this. Now, here is, here is probably the most crushing part of class for the student. You know, they made their beads, they're looking down, they're proud. And then I say, well, we need to erase these things. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, erase them? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna erase them. Or erase most of them. Okay? And so, when we are erasing, we're just going across We don't have to cut it completely flat because the next skill we're going to teach is the opposite of a B. Now, and that would be Cove. Cove begins where the bead ended. So, when I was doing the bead and I was rolled and raised, I'm going to start in the raised position and then do two things. I'm going to roll the tool and creep it up the cut. Now, here we really have to talk about, with the gouge, we never want to cut going uphill. Because we will get a very serious catch. And catches are not good. So, we basically will do the same thing. We will start here. Oh, that. Open and creep up. Stop at 12. Now, this is one time when I have to cheat. Okay? So I adjusted my hand position. And I've got hold. But it's very important that as we increase the depth of the code that the tool slides up the wood. Now, I like my code. So what I would do here, turn it off, and we're going to do the same thing again. We're going to practice with the lathe off, the turn, and the creep uphill. We're going to do that for both sides. Man, this is actually cutting. <laughs> That's great. Okay, and we'll do that for both sides. Then, we'll do codes. That's what happens when you're not paying good attention.
do one more to see if I can... I think maybe part of the problem is I'm too far away. Which... Do you, start, do you start at a 90 degree? Yes. When you enter your cut? Yes. So, and sometimes that's hard to know that you're 90 degrees. Yes. So, I want, I want my flute straight at three. And I think what I'm doing is I'm getting too far around this way. Remember that our flute dictates where we go. Right. And so, you know, if I'm too flat this way, when my flute hit, it wants to catch and jerk it back. So, if I begin this a little... with the, the bevel pointed straight in, let's see if that's a little easier friendly. Oh yeah. So now my belly was getting in the way on that side. Imagine that. Though. I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room with that problem. Yep. Okay, so we practice. We make several. They don't all have to be the same size. But, what I like to get across to students is the three things we've done by now. Flat, cove, and bead. Everything in wood turning is one of those things. And now you can begin to make things look pretty by combining these elements. I can take and make half of a bead. Uphill will kill you every time. Alright? So, I've got that. Oh, let's let's say... I want to shallow this out. And I think maybe I'll make this, this little hump right here into a, a bead. And then... Another bead. Oh, let me put a little flap right there. A little fillet. That's probably too wide to look good. But, you know, students can start to see how we can take these Something that's very, very nice. Now, my philosophy in beginning class is it doesn't have to be perfect. You know, later on we are going to do some sanding, we are going to do some finishing, but I don't hold the students in this class accountable to the standards I hold myself to. Because it takes a while to develop an eye for design. Now, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings that have been in class, but design-wise, some of the things I've seen in class are just way too busy and almost bordering on ugly. <laughs> but I, I kind of bite my tongue. It's a, it's not that important. It's tool skills 
and those kind of things. Okay, so this is our first week after we've gone over introduction, tool part, safety, that's it. First week. Okay, the second week. We do two projects. Uh, uh, I don't want to waste that big piece of cherry. Okay. Uh, one project is a honey dipper. It, it reinforces all of our cuts from the previous week. And then we throw a little fun in. Because second week, what we do is bend tops. Now, David Haynes is really far in the back. Can you hear me, David? I hear you. Good. As we were doing show and tell, I didn't tell you this. But you know what I was thinking about your tops? They're almost as good as Vicky's. <laughs> Vicky does a very nice top. So, one of these days I'm going to make tops as well as Vicky does. Okay, so the piece that I prepared earlier we're going to now put in the chuck because this is going to be a spin top. Now, I'm going to go back there and steal temporarily one of David's tops. But I'll return. So, I'm going to switch to a smaller tool rest. I think I can even get away with even a smaller tool rest. And I'm going to check my center. I'm a little high, so it would be best if I lowered the tool rest just a little bit, making sure everything is right. Okay. And true it up. What? I got it. Zoom in some more, Matt. Okay. I've zoomed in some more. I'm going to get the tool rest out of my way because I don't want to gore myself. Because just like Gordon, I don't want to be seeing any blood. Okay. So the most important part of the top. If I want a good spinner, it's got to be, have a great point on it. think that would work. And because I'm using pretty good technique, even though this is pallet oak, it works. Yeah. I wouldn't have to sand that much. Okay. The reason we do this part before we do the handle and all this other business is I've left the mass and I get more support. 
That way it's not flopping around. Now I'm ready to form the rest of the top. I'm going to cheat because every time we can get a chance to use a skew in class, we do it. And I'm just making it increasingly deeper to be cut. I got to be a little ambitious there, taking off a little more than I should have. can basically just waste this away to create my handle. something I generally show in class, but Work. 
Okay, I'm gonna fart it off. You know, our class members make these and they love them. They are so much fun. They take them home. They take them home. They play with them. If you haven't done a few tops, you need to do a few tops. I'll tell you why. We're going to have another sale in in September where we need some more little things to sell. Tops are great. Especially if you can make them look as good as David's and Vicky's. Now, I cannot help when we're getting down close to the end of class like we are with this demonstration. And we have this little butt that's left. I'm obviously doing something wrong. I know what I'm doing wrong. I'm talking and turning at the same time. <laughs> yep. I'm not concentrating on doing everything right. Ah, there it goes. There it goes. Okay. Sometimes you just have those kind of days. What? Sometimes you just have those kind of days. Yeah, and the likelihood of that happening when you're doing a demonstration is like a million to a million. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. All right. Now, I get down to here and I'm like, oh. I was at SWAT. I went to one of the big name skew chisel demonstrations and he got to be Joe Shulman. Oh, I just lost that one. I went too deep. I will almost always do a small top. The more times we can practice with tools, the better or the more proficient we will become. Thank you. 
bottom line. And when everything is right, turning is fun. Alright, thank you for being here today. <laughs>